Okay, today is uh, March 20th of uh, 2014, and today we're going to take a look at uh, Paul Ricoeur again. Uh, we're examining his uh, systematic phenomenology, but we're uh, examining it uh, in its three-volume set that was included into one volume, entitled Memory, History, and Forgetting, which was published in 2004 by University of Chicago Press. And it is the uh, presentation of Ricoeur's complete system. But one thing we need to understand, and Ricoeur stated this in his book at the very beginning, he said uh, that he did not uh, believe that he was presenting a linear view of his uh, phenomenology and that uh, it was better to understand it as a reciprocal a view that contained reciprocal moments and not a, a triad of linear moments. So he does present a triad, but he uh, does not expect us to take it uh, as a strict linear structure, but instead to be a little more fluid than that, allow it to be a reciprocal model, and uh, allow the three uh, moments of the triad to work interchangeably with each other at any particular moment in his phenomenology. So it's a very uh, fluid or a very dynamic structure. And it, uh, he has to tell us, he has to make this statement initially on because essentially he's presenting his uh, moments, his three moments out of order. He's not really presenting uh, the triad in a, a logical structural order that you would think because you would think that the uh, antithesis of memory is forgetting so you would think it would be a uh, memory forgetting and then history and that's really what his system is his system really is a, a triad of memory forgetting and history and so we're going to take a look at uh, history in this lecture but uh, you can think of it as the culmination of what he's trying to do in the book. Because what he seeks to do is present a philosophy that leads to a, a written narrative of his phenomenology. He wants to present uh, the three moments that lead to the written narrative as our expression of the truth. And so what are the moments that, that take us to the written narrative? And in, from his point of view, it's, it's going to be a overall structure that is a phenomenology. So it's a phenomenology that takes up three different uh, points of view, three different modalities, or, or what he calls is three different gazes. And so he's got the subjective gaze of memory, and then he has the, uh, the reciprocal part of that subjective gaze as forgetting. And those two will work reciprocally together in an interrelated relationship, and it will lead to the objective gaze of uh, actually defining the historical narrative that interprets history with a historical structure, which is expressed as a written narrative. Is express, expressed as a written narrative, <clears throat> and we will it, find out in this particular section that that means it's a a biblion, a book of truth, aletheia. So he's, the goal is to reach the level of the written biblion, and we have to pass through memory, we have to pass through forgetting to reach that level. Now we've already discussed memory, and in memory, uh, Ricoeur introduced us to uh, the name of passive memory, that if you remember that was uh, presented with the uh, Self is presented with the atomic meanings of history and verbal testimony. And then the self shaped those into a preliminary shape. But then the self transitioned to a anonymous or recollection, which was at the Dokunta threshold of a communal critical work. But still at the uh, more a uh, motivational level, unconscious level. And in that way, uh, 
recollection help to shape a uh, a more complete image that was going to be in the stage of memory, it was going to be a two-pass, an imprinting of the self with a, a two-pass of deeper meaning as an interpretation of history. So the, the goal was to reach this two-pass image that would be imprinted within the self, and then the self worked through the uh, cognitive side and eventually reached a, a, a first narrative of what Ricoeur called in the gaze of memory, the uh, collection of traces or the uh, collection of the traces of meaning. And the Greek word there actually means a uh, footprint. So the uh, traces, the footprints, the traces of the otherness of the depth of meaning are gathered together as a narrative collection of traces that's eventually formed on the subjective side, so we do have we do have a writing uh, even before we reach this final level of a, a true biblion. We do have a writing, but it's a it's not a biblion at the level of memory. It's a uh, sulego ikne, or in other words, it's a collection. It's a collection of traces of meaning. A collection of traces of meaning, and then it engages in a, and we're going to cover this last because it's the last section of his book, but then it engages in a reciprocal relationship with forgetting. But forgetting is one of those generic terms that uh, means nothing like the term actually sounds. It's forgetting is a, which really need to do with uh, Ricoeur's take up the metaphor of growing. And think of a, uh, Well, since uh, he's going to eventually bring us to Biblion, think of the growing of an olive tree. And in the uh, first moment of memory, we grow the constellation of a narrative through memory. We grow the constellation of a narrative of the collection of traces. And then after it's grown, it uh, doesn't quite match up with what we expected. There's still a little bit of a In commensurability, there's a, a, a lack. There's something lacking there. And so we still feel some uh, dissemblance and some challenge within ourselves. And so in forgetting, if you maintain the metaphor of growing, forgetting is pruning. So you have uh, the growing in the moment of memory, and then you have the pruning in the moment of forgetting. And that will lead to the... Uh, Biblion of truth as a narrative is new growth. The third moment will be the new growth. And so it is a triad, but uh, again, you could uh, you could put it in uh, the order he has in the book here of discussing the subjective gaze and then the objective gaze and then talk about the pruning that got you there. So he, he, he's taking it in order of a subjective gaze, objective gaze, and then the functional pruning that uh, allows the emergence of new growth, the emergence of a, a new event. So it does take a, it does take a logical approach, but it really is a little bit of a camouflage as to what his triad really is, because he it makes the second and third moment kind of interchangeable. But uh, He's, he's presenting it in the order of subjective gaze of the uh, interpretation of history, and then the objective gaze of the interpretation of history, and then the actual written Biblion narrative of Aletheia Truth as the emerging event of new growth, of new meaning. And that's his overall system, and that's a reason a lot of people have trouble with his book, I read one reviewer. A reviewer said that uh, the book was as dense as a brick, and it is a difficult book. I will admit it is a very difficult book. It demands a lot of uh, attentiveness. It demands a lot of uh, note taking, and then uh, 
various uh, degrees of pruning back your notes uh, to get to the point of new birth. And so it's a, it is a process. It is a difficult book. It's not small. It's a 600-page volume. But as I've already mentioned, it's three volumes in one. It's his three moments, and it was his uh, final work that depicted his entire um, system of phenomenology. So we want to keep this one at 30 minutes if we can. So what we're going to look at now, now that we have the overall, then let's take a look at this uh, objective gaze where we have the uh, philosophical writing of uh, the intentionality that's in history being articulated within Ricoeur's phenomenology framework. And basically, uh, in this uh, moment of history, the historical gaze, interpreting history uh, with the objective gaze, he says we go through eight steps, and they are, uh, I did attach a, a glossary to this before I posted it, so you can refer to the glossary. But the uh, Koros Katoikeo is inhabited space, and the very first thing we do is uh, define the inhabited space that is being our verbally presented to us in a verbal testimony. And then second, we, uh, we want to enlarge that within the context of an inhabited world. So we want the verbal testimony to be, to be looked at in a more universal context. And so it goes back to his linguistic philosophy of uh, you begin with atomic propositions and then transition to a compound proposition that encloses the singularities of uh, truth. And then third, we will move to the Dekunta threshold where we measure these uh, inhabited world images that people share in order to reach a uh, communal consensus. And this is a, a stage where he says that the uh, proposed content becomes accredited and the thought materials become ready for shaping into an atomic archival document or an atomic historical document. So we're going to begin with uh, documents. Well, actually, we're going to begin with a verbal testimony that's presented in our external situations, in our external history. Then we're going to... Uh, apprehend that uh, verbal testimony of our own historical environment. And we're going to develop um, a first historical document, which will be an atomic document, if you continue with the Wittgenstein idea of atomic and compound propositions. We form an atomic historical document, and then we're going to proceed through the uh, cognitive side of consciousness and we're going to take that document and we're going to enter into a communal relationship, a communal evaluation again, but this time on the cognitive side it is always the what? The composition threshold. So we transition from the docunta threshold of motivation to the composition threshold of the cognitive work of evaluating all atomic document presentations that are going to be cognitive uh, documents to compile them into a more universal picture, a more universal narrative, and that more universal narrative is called the uh, Biblion, the book. So he wants to take us from testimony to document to book. From testimony to document to book. And we will uh, have to pass through his uh, view of Logos at the historical level, as we did also at the subjective uh, individual level. And in this case, he's going to say that the Logos is a, an atenidzo, atenidzo syllogike, atenidzo syllogike, and that is the intersubjective gaze. And this is what shapes the configuration of the Logos on the historical lev level. Everyone has their own scale that they apply to evaluating history, and we we share those together to develop a communal, um, collective consciousness idea of this uh, gaze or this uh, scale. 
And the example he uses there, he uses the metaphor of a cartography or map mapping, making. If you look at a map, that map has a scale. You know, one uh, inch equals a uh, 100 miles, whatever, you know, there's a, a scale that determines the way you're going to look at the map. And it's going to be the same architecture, but, you know, um, 10 different people could draw 10 different maps with 10 different scales, and all 10 maps would be representations of the exact same topographical experience. And Ricoeur says in history, we do the same thing. We all examine our history the exact same environmental history that we all look at, but uh, between 10 of us, we would come up with 10 different filters of scale uh, determining the way that we want to draw our image. And I might be a, a bit more um, microcosmic focused, and you might be a little bit more macrocosmic focused, and we might come up with a two different points of view and two different uh, historical images or historical uh, compositions, but we're basically presenting the same thing. So you write an atomic historical document representing your kind of a macro cosmic view of the situation and of history in general. And I present an atomic um, historical document of a more microcosmic scale on a more microcosmic point of view. And and you and I both carry those to the uh, composition threshold where there are eight more people waiting with their eight different scales that are fall somewhere between the microcosmic and the macrocosmic. There are variations on both of those. And we end up with a, a spectrum. We end up with a broad spectrum of scales. And that spectrum of scales is called a, a syllogike, a syllogike. That's, that's the word for intersubjective. The uh, syllogike atenidzo, and atenidzo is a is fixed focus or a gaze or that uh, point of view gaze of scale. So that's the logos that we will pass through in order to reach this biblion, but we don't pass through there until we first uh, articulate our own atomic historical document and that atomic historical, doc historical document must be articulated after we do the uh, the work of uh, forming our thought picture on an objective level and also pass through that uh, Dokunta threshold because remember we always have that uh, threshold of discussing motivations before we ever pass over to the cognitive side and have a threshold of discussing the rational cognitive debate over our presentation. So we have a motivational critique and we have a uh, rational critique. We have an emotional critique and we have a rational critique of what we present. So we're not going to cover this exactly step by step because I already gave you the eight steps but we're going to look at a few highlights in this process and we'll, we'll look at really the culminating moments. If you look on the unconscious side before we pass over to the uh, Dokunta threshold of uh, the uh, motivational debate over the uh, legitimacy of our image that we form of history, of the, of the meaning of history. We first reach the uh, moment of a, what uh, Ricoeur calls a document, documentary moment, a documentary phase of the temporal picture of the meaning of history. And basically he says here that uh, we want to reach a, a oikumene of inhabited world an oikumene of inhabited world, and we do that uh, by gathering together seven aspects of the of content that we're going to shape together into a thought picture. And he says that uh, initially, what we carry in this uh, unconscious workspace 
is the horizon of wanting to define a universality of space and time. And we have the uh, internalization of a declared memory that is enclosed and bracketed within us of our apprehension on a personal level of the verbal testimony. And we also have uh, our definition of the uh, situation's uh, presentation of inhabited space, which is a structured space. In other words, it's uh, an inhabited space of a the sensate sense of our finite reality. And we also have a uh, the chronosophic trace, and that's on the temporal realm. We have a, an initial grasping of the directional sense of our reality that faces us. So we have the uh, we have a, an idea of the sensate sense and an idea of the directional sense of what is being presented, and we have a, an instance here of a of the trace of the emerging absolute otherness. which he calls the absolute here and the absolute now. And what we do is we apply a layer type imaging. We apply a geometric layer over the uh, sensate experience and thereby combine space and time and create inha an inhabited world interpretation of the univer universality that is being pointed to in the situation we face. It's more of a just a, a motivational picture, but we get a, a kind of a picture of the horizon. We get a picture of the trajectory of history, and as a philosopher, that's what we define. We define we're not we're not trying to duplicate or just copy events of history. That's not what writing history is. As a philosopher, we want to write the trajectory of history, the trajectory of historical events that point to the emergence of the event of deeper meaning and uh, the event of true aletheia, true history. So we're writing intentionality. We're writing directional sense. We're writing uh, the horizon of history as a eventual biblical written document, which in Ricoeur's case, it's this book. His uh, book of 2004 is his uh, final interpretation of the trajectory of history and so he gives us a three-volume structure of what that means. So, but eventually, every individual needs to reach, in Ricoeur's mind, he says that every individual needs to reach this scholarly level of presenting a scholarly presentation of the trajectory of the meaning of history. And then we uh, exchange those by repeating the uh, cyclical triad of emergence again, again, and again, and keep lifting that uh, scholarly dialogue. But in his mind, the goal is to reach, uh, to bring, the self is to bring a structure of history to the level of scholarly written discourse. The self is to bring a structure of history to the level of scholarly written discourse. And so he is lifting up the field of philosophy. He thinks that uh, he realized, of course, in his day, he realized in 2004 that philosophy was dying and almost non-existent in the university as a legitimate science. So he is lifting up philosophy and saying that philosophy is the essential science and that uh, we must bring the structure of history to a level of scholarly written discourse, and that's the goal of his presentation. Well, we do form this... Uh, First, a document, documentary phase, temporal picture of an ideal thought picture. And we take that ideal thought picture and we take it to the Dokunta threshold. And here we do the work of uh, what he calls the communal echo to reach um, certification. So at the Dokunta threshold, we want to reach a certification of our thought picture image of the meaning of history. And he says this is a... a process of accreditation. And uh, first of all, it's critical. There's a judicial questioning that takes place. It's a measurement. There's a measurement through the f given forms of reason 
and there's a negation of any secondary elaborations that we've tagged on to the meaning and they need to be negated and stripped and then Ricoeur says there's also really uh, an evaluation of the praxis effectiveness of what we're proposing and its ability to keep its promise and so there is a practical analysis as well even at the level of the Dokunta threshold and then he says uh, that our proposed model must enhance the social intersubjectivity. And what we end up with after we emerge from this uh, de Kunta threshold of uh, the debate of motivation is a group of thought materials that form kind of an informal lexical network. So we end up with kind of a lexical network of acceptable terms, acceptable uh, lexical terms that have not reached conceptual language yet, but they're going to in the very next step. But out of the De Kunta threshold, they are still just, they've just been separated out of the uh, thought picture image, and they're more or less lexical thought materials. They're, they're kind of partitioned off as uh, accredited and certified as being uh, available for constructing a legitimate atomic historical document. So after we've left the stage of uh, forming our thought picture and passing through the stage of a critical debate and discussion of our thought picture image along with others and their thought picture image of motivational meaning of uh, the meaning of history, we're able to write our own singular contribution to the universal meaning of history. And our sing singular contribution takes the, uh, is now able to take the initial spoken testimony of experience and transition to uh, a true historical archived document. It's still a singular document. It's still atomic. It's not a compound book. It's a, a atomic document. But it is an articulated um, documentary trace. It's a, an atomic singular testimony. Uh, and it's an anticipation of being integrated into an overarching compound archival book. But that is an anticipation. It is uh, evolved from the De Kunta threshold. And it is uh, situated, in other words, it is an enchaining together of the uh, an ordered spacing of those lexical elements. And uh, all hearsay aspects are negated and only the essential are retained. So we have a partitioning of uh, stripping away the hearsay aspects of that what comes out of the uh, De Kunta threshold. And then uh, an enchaining of the essential elements into a structured whole. And intentionality is emphasized in the document. And we emerge to a self of doing history. So writing history becomes doing history. That we are the self of doing history. And at this point, we can take our singular atomic document and transition to the cognitive side. And when we do that, we enter in, into the... Uh, the trajectory toward the written Biblion book. And we begin, first of all, with a temporal emplotment. The very first moment will be temporal emplotment. And in temporal emplotment, we start out with a carved out historical object out of our uh, singular document of what we consider to be uh, the objective meaning of history. We actually turn it into a positive objective object. And then we want to implot a time model. And we do that by uh, examining uh, within history there is a an existing plurality of uh, typologies that have been presented of the universal meaning of history. We examine those and use those as a partial critique. And then we uh, engage in 
enlisting our own disciplined imagination and intelligible imagination to work out a practical structuring of the possibilities that are available for realizing this uh, universality of meaning that we want to posit. But in doing that, uh, we're going to engage uh, two fundamental aspects. That's going to be the gaze and the trace. And the gaze is our own subjective gaze, our own subjective point of view, which we never escape. Everybody has their own subjective point of view or standing in at the composition threshold. Our own way of uh, scaling our topographical map. And then uh, we all have our version of the trace of the emergence of otherness in the situation and in historical reality. So we end up positing our atomic historical document as a historical object. We uh, mediate it through the uh, different, uh, what he calls mentalities, but it's the different um, scaled typologies that exist in the world today that together can be gathered together to kind of represent a, a, a collective horizon or collective trajectory that is already present in history that is coupled with our own our own singular atomic presentation and then together we end up uh, plotting our own subjective idea of scale over our singular atomic document so document gets coupled with our scale of horizon or our scale of trajectory and so it becomes a, a, a trajectory of promise that enlists our singular historical document. Now that's when it has to be measured that's when it has to be measured against logos for Ricoeur because remember logos is the collective scale representation so it's going to measure it's, it's going to be the collective version of promise. It's going to be measured against our singular version of promise to uh, lead to a, a eventual writing of a universal biblion of the book of truth that compiles a plurality of singular atomic documents within an, encl an enclosure of a book, the enclosure of a biblion. So a biblion encloses a plurality of a Biblizions. A Biblizion is a document and a Biblion is a book. So a Biblion encloses a plurality of Biblizions that are um, the offerings from different individuals gathered at the uh, composition threshold. But the goal is writing, but it's the goal of a final truth of writing, a final universal truth rather than the particular versions of truth that we carry to the composition threshold. We carry our particular versions of the truth as a Biblizion's, as a Biblizion document, but a Biblizion document just possesses a trace of the truth. It doesn't possess a holistic aletheia type truth, but it possesses a singular trace. So I carry my singular trace of promise to the composition threshold and you carry your singular trace of promise to the composition threshold and then we compile together the biblion of the uh, singular universality that encloses all of the Bi biblizion documents and we end up with uh, what he calls the representation stage and then we have reached a scholarly document and of course we take the scholarly document and enter back through the cycle and run it again and again because the process never reach, reaches finality for Ricoeur it's always history is always a history that interrogates us it always interrogates us existentially it always asks for an expression of its deeper meaning and that will never change so we reach a level of a uh, scholarly written discourse but then uh, instead of exchanging verbal testimonies now we begin exchanging scholarly scholarly written discourse and again we move through the process we raise it till the next level and then we raise it to the next level and we raise to deeper and deeper meanings of significance of what the significance of event is 
for the overarching understanding of the meaning of history. So we write philosophy, even though Ricoeur calls it history, he's really presenting a, a position on how do we write philosophy. Because for Ricoeur in 2004, philosophy was disappearing, and he thought that uh, it was the one science that uh, could not afford to disappear. So he says that uh, we need to uh, give it a rebirth and make that our uh, integrated reciprocal work in order to present uh, a true aletheia biblion of interpreted meaning of history as event. So it's all integrated within this over overarching system of the uh, growing of the constellation of the narrative of history and then the pruning back of the non-essential so that uh, we can have a new growth of a true aletheia historical narrative. And that uh, ran a little over 30 minutes, but still uh, it was a lot of material, but it gives a chance to integrate things into the larger picture for Ricoeur. And so the next uh, final lecture will be on forgetting or this work of pruning uh, in order to uh, unveil the full Aletheia truth.